Is Elizabeth on the call? There we go. Hi, it's actually Elizabeth from D. Um, so let me just share my screen with you. Hi, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. It's a pleasure to introduce you guys to uh, my company, uh, Digni. Digni is a leader in diversity data management. We provide the solutions for HR leaders that want to measure diversity and improve inclusion in their organizations. I'm an expert in diversity in North America, and I've been consulting in this space for over 10 years. And in all of my years consulting, the number one problem that I encountered was that clients were trying to solve anecdotal problems instead of digging into the bigger issue. They were missing the data. Is that famous adage from Peter Drucker, you can't measure, or you can't manage what you don't measure. And companies are trying to deal with diversity and inclusion like whack-a-mole. Their responses were reactive and ineffective. They're not measured or strategic, which is what you need to have to actually have results. That, and that's what we do. And senior leadership really wants to see that from boards to C-suite to VPs. Senior leadership has a mandate to improve diversity and inclusion. And we have the software solutions to help them to do it. We're currently on a pre-seed raise, um, and I would be really happy to chat with you about that any further. Now is really the time for progressive action on diversity, diversity and inclusion. The, the, the time for progressive messaging is well past. Um, now that's what we see time and time again with companies, and we see it in the media that people want to see actual change, and we've created the solution to help them uh, to get there. So if you'd like to hear more about it and hear more, hopefully, about our pre-seed round, please feel free to email me at the email below. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, well, thank you to our lightning pitchers. I uh, just want to remind everyone to keep the conversation going on social. If you want to interact with us, here is our social credentials. And now on to the main event. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel moderator today, Matt Carlson. Not only is Matt an excellent source of insight on this topic, but he's also a past chair of the BEF. Um, Matt's a leader at Collier's Canadian Technology Practice Group where he oversees a team of advisors in Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, and other major markets. Over his tenure, he's completed more than 500 real estate projects for startups, Canadian unicorns, and multinational public companies, accounting for approximately 1 billion in aggregated value. As a past founder of a technology startup, Matt is passionate about entrepreneurship. He's currently an investor in technology companies and has advised young entrepreneurs about their products and strategies. So I'll pass it over to Matt and Matt can give a little intro to himself and introduce the panel as well. So we can switch slides, I think, Michaela. Perfect. There we Thanks go. for the kind intro, Scott. I was uh, thanking you and realized I was on mute there. Um, so I have, a, I have a short presentation today just to touch on a few themes that we'll be going through. Um, obviously the future workplace, talking about talent, the space itself, and uh, asking a number of questions of our panelists. So um, with that, I'd like to int introduce our three panelists for today. Um, Anu Janan, um, he's a talented technology leader dedicated to maximizing the value of technology, people, and processes throughout his organization, which is Osenko, it's an engineering uh, mining company, global mining company. Um, his mantra is to always ensure the right synergy between technology and business, focusing around IT efficiency and productivity. Uh, he's often heard to say there, there must be a better way to do things, and um, he drives his team to never accept the status quo. Um, Mikhail uh, Brunet Frappier, uh, I probably butchered your name, I apologize. Um, Mikhail is a, in charge and works with Scott uh, as the leader of Workday Planning and Analyti Analytics at IBM. Um, he, he's a leader in cloud innovation uh, and he specializes day to day in planning and ad adaptive planning and analytics. He's a product lead and he's an in-house expert uh, with respect to the Workday ecosystem. You know, he's, he's driven by change. Mikhail takes pride in providing innovative solutions to enable organizations to embrace the cognitive area. And like other IBMers since the start of the COVID-19 crisis, he's applied his keen interest in workplace management and employee experience to lead and develop an innovative solution to facilitate the return to work uh, 
and to enable organizations with some of their challenges. Welcome, Mikhail. Um, and last but not least, we have Jean McClellan, uh, National People and Organization Leader at PwC. Uh, she is a partner in the Canadian Management Consulting and Technology Practice, and she leads their organization uh, for people and uh, consulting across the country. Jean has over 20 years of consulting experience working with multidisciplinary teams to solve complex issues for her clients across the country. She has spent the last decade of her career helping clients transform their organizations by activating their people and embracing technology. She believes that people and culture are what differentiates highly successful organizations and loves spending time in the mountains, hiking with her family. Um, with that, I will switch to the brief presentation about the future workplace uh, and proceed to ask some questions of our panelists. So starting in March this year, most people on the call probably moved to a rapid remote first strategy. There was new work, there was new technology, accommodations that you had to make for your teams or that your employer made of you. And you know, generally as we're seven months into this, the return to work is deemed to be fairly fluid. I think, oh, perfect, thank you. <clears throat> so by the numbers, roughly 75% of knowledge workers are currently working from home full time. What's interesting is most people tend to say they would like to work from home uh, and spend the majority of their time working in a remote setting. On the flip side, 70% of people are struggling with work from home in some way. They're either lonely, they feel it's difficult to collaborate, they're distracted, they have trouble unplugging, um, the work that they do with their team is not the same, but 50% of people that are currently working from home would like some sort of hybrid model. Interestingly, um, what's most important to some of these, uh, oh, sorry, I thought that was a question for me. Uh, what's, it, what's most important to most employees is 100% or nearly 100% of people feel that flexibility is the key benefit to working from home. That could mean eliminating a commute. It could mean a flexible schedule, uh, commingling personal and work activities, spending more time with family. As this goes on, however, we found that 20% of employers actually pay for, home, for costs at home. So for employees that need work accommodations, cell phone, internet, um, only 20% of employers are actually paying for that today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So where are we today? There's generally three camps, according to protocol.com. There's the we're coming back soon camp. There's the ask me in a year camp of which many of the big tech companies are in. Uh, and then there's probably the most extreme, we're never going back camp. However, what we found is that as things have progressed between March and today, some people started in one and shifted to another and others have come back to the original uh, since the start of the pandemic. So this is a busy slide, but it gives you a sense of what some of the most notable announcements have been around re remote work, um, in, in particular with big tech companies. In March, most people were moved to a work from home model. In May, Twitter was notably the first to announce that they'd be working from home forever, um, which is hard to go back from that position. Facebook about a week later said they would move to permanent remote work. However, what's interesting is you know, as you look across this timeline, many of the big tech companies have revised their work from home announcements since they made their initial announcement. Facebook, if you look sort of at the top middle of the slide, um, August 7th, they went from permanent to June 2021, and then made a further announcement that they would adjust uh, the pay of employees if they located further from head office. You know, Google's made similar announcements where they said they would be away until summer of 2021, and then um, further, further mentioned that they would return some days for all 200,000 of their employees. Microsoft had originally claimed that they would be back in January of 2021. And as of last week, made an announcement that they would be hybrid for 50% of their staff, for 50% of their schedule. And the announcement that they made, I think was personally, I think was actually one of the most interesting is they really tapped into the need for flexibility and they said that they would go out of their way to provide flexibility for their employees seeking to work from home. Uh, next slide. Just a couple of quotes there, you know, positives and negatives. What I found interesting, you know, we've heard Shopify saying that, you know, office centricity is over. 
Um, Facebook is saying one thing, and you know, some might argue that Facebook has more data on who is actually working from home than anyone in the world. Um, you know, in May, they said they'll let people work from home permanently. Meanwhile, in August, they leased 730,000 square feet in Manhattan, and they spent nearly $400 million to buy an office building in Seattle. Uh, on the flip side, Amazon's actually been one of the more aggressive. They look forward to returning to the workplace. Um, they're betting on office-based work. They're expanding in major cities. And then on the flip side, we have um, you know financial services firms like J.P. Morgan saying work output was particularly affected on Mondays and Fridays, and they feel that there are missed learning opportunities, especially for younger workers in the workforce. Um, we won't talk about all these quotes, but generally speaking, Microsoft is saying that people need connectivity, which I think is a little self-serving. Uh, Netflix is one of the most extreme, where their CEO said he doesn't see any positives. I think his, his quote is probably the most interesting, where uh, he believes people, the five-day work week will go back to a four-day work, work week going forward. And just a couple more themes. I'm not sure, Michaela, is that, oh, thank you. Um, so what's the fallout? Cities are vacant, rents are down, retail rents are down, office buildings are roughly 20% occupied, residential rents are also down, people are essentially fleeing cities uh, and looking for more suburban or rural accommodations um, while their offices are effectively closed for up to a year, if not longer. Um, the benefit, however, is Americans generally spent 225 hours commuting in 2019 which equates to about nine full days in the car per year. Um, they've now received that time back. People, um, for the parents in the audience, uh, this probably looks familiar. The interesting thing is, you know, when we talk about struggles, um, isolation, anxiety, stress plays into it. Some have said that, you know, mental health issues that were prevalent before the pandemic have been accelerated in some ways, good ways and bad ways, where people are more likely to talk about these issues, being at home and to be more candid with their employers about things that would help them. Um, unfortunately, this has also accelerated the gender gap. You know, mothers have only recovered roughly half the jobs that they've lost during the pandemic. This is US data. Um, fathers recovering almost three quarters. Um, furthermore, looking down the road, women are considering changing roles or leaving the workforce altogether. So going forward, um, what does that hybrid workplace look like? You know, there's Zoom, there's Zoom fatigue, there's Zoom meetings. Some people are even doing silent meetings where they effective, they essentially co-work next to an employee while they're on Zoom and they don't talk. Um, it's interesting, I've tried it. Um, you know, will people ever return? How many days will they return? What type of work will they perform when they get back? Um, the impact of children in schools on the workforce. Um, some may have heard about a K-shaped recovery where those at the top are actually thriving and those at the bottom are struggling and are expected to struggle. And then, of course, the magic question about vaccines and whether we need a vaccine before returning to work and, you know, whether employers will start to mandate that people return in some form or fashion. So with that, I will turn it over to our panelists. Thank you for joining. Um, so I have a broad question and I know that Michaela, you're working, we have some poll questions for the audience. So, you know, please stop me when um, you'd like to ask, but, you know, we could always pose the first question of the audience. Um, I do have a broad question for our panelists and a couple of lightning round questions. So, you know, maybe quickly to get everyone talking. Oh, perfect, there we go. I'd love to hear this from our panelists going forward. How many days would you like to spend at your workplace? ranging from zero to four, I'm going to fill this, or zero to five, I'm going to fill this out as well. And Michaela can report. Awesome, so for I'll the give this about 10 more seconds and then I'll close the poll. Sure, why don't we ask the panelists, Jean, how many days are you going to spend at work going forward? So I said two, uh, yeah. again, yeah, I said two. I, I think that I can do much of my work remotely, but again, yeah. as we've seen from our studies, hybrid work is um, really the, the way of the future and what employees want. Uh, I'm one of those employees. So I think employers 
have to think about that in their workforce strategies going forward. Nice. Mikhail? Yes, answer one. So, one. Uh, yeah, I, I used to go at the office once a week to at least make sure to meet the team, with work closely with the team, help collaboration and tie close close relationships. So I think at the end, working from home is, is the future. Uh, but yeah, one, I think it's important to at least build a strong relationship with people. Anush, how about you? Uh, thanks, Matt. I think I'm at the other end of uh, the spectrum compared to Mikhail. I'm, I'm at four right now. I would have gone <laughs> yeah. three and a half if that choice was there, but I, I went with four. I rounded up. Yeah, I'll probably be four, personally. Um, will you guys ever shake hands again? Thumbs up, thumbs down? <laughs> Maybe? Yeah. Ian says yes. I'm a hugger, Matt. So the, I've had to really teach myself to give the fist bump mm -hmm. and... Uh, Stop yep. trying to hug everyone I see. Yeah, the um, elbow. We we have elbow. Uh, our social norm is the is the elbow. <laughs> Fair enough. And we just got our poll results. Looks like most people are actually fairly well balanced between one and three. Twenty seven percent for one day a week, twenty four percent for two, eighteen for three, twenty one, and then effectively nothing for zero and five. Interesting. <clears throat> Um, one more, one more question before we move on to the long form for, for all the panelists, what's the best quote from your team about working from home? Whoever wants to start. I think, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll jump before anyone uses this line. The, the best one I've heard, and I think I hear it over and over again is you're on mute. Yeah. That's a good one. This one is hard to beat, you know, <laughs> it's fun. that's okay. That's why I went in first. A good one. Followed, followed by, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, doing that. yeah. yeah. And, and of course, talking out over each other kind of, this is kind of a multi cult. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I'm sure, I'm sure the audience wants to hear from you and your experience. Um, I'm open who wants to go first, but I'd like to know what happened with you, your team, and your organization over the past seven months, starting in March, you know, when did you work from home? What was the change? And what did you see through the summer and into the fall? Mm -hmm. So for us at, at IBM, um, we were pretty quick uh, to kind of, IBM stated to kind of, yeah, go, we, from now we work from home. And from the start, one thing that IBM think, thought that it will be really important to kind of uh, make people feel safe uh, while working from home is like we, we released this IBM pledge. So to, and this IBM pledge was really about like, make sure that you see the first statement, like be there for your family. So if you need, and I think that, you know, from the start was setting a really good ground for us to feel safe working from home. Since most, even like if, if for most of us, we, we were already working a lot from home, but you know, it was giving us this opportunity to really kind of, create a safe zone for us, you know, since the start. So the pledge was really important there. Yeah. Absolutely. How about you, Jean, just because you're off mute uh, to pick on Anoush. Uh, what was the experience like for you and your team over the past seven months? Yeah, so uh, our teams made the transition really well. So we had invested, you know, for several years before uh, in a mobile first strategy. Yeah. You know, we, we are out with clients um, a lot. We need the flexibility. So we had a business imperative even before COVID. So that served us well through, through the entire pandemic. Um, as we uh, were virtually working, it really was um, watching out for our teams who, you know, who potentially didn't have home environments that were ideal. So, you know, first of all, we did look at, at parents uh, and, you know, people, particularly with younger children, we had to be very open and flexible about working models and the ability to stay productive uh, and really thinking about that as well. Yeah. I think everyone has uh, now very much adjusted to seeing children on online and, and the likes of that. And I actually think that's probably... Um, for the better in a business community to bring the human side of business. And it ac actually really helps when you're doing diversity and inclusion initiatives for people to bring their whole self to work. So this was yeah. a nice little exercise to be able to do that. Um, we also though, um, 
quickly realized that it wasn't just parents that you know that that those uh, challenges could be in anyone that we worked with right so we had to be very very uh, careful we had a number of our team members who worked in our urban centers particularly in Vancouver and Toronto who were living in you know small boxes by themselves yeah. uh, so you know that isolation mm -hmm. set in so we had to make sure we we wrapped our arms around them uh, you know, I had I had one team member. I was telling the panelists earlier that um, had seven roommates. Uh, was just recently graduated from school and was taking calls on his roof uh, oh, no. because they had all been laid off and he hadn't. So, um, you know, so really it was it was really about taking time to understand and and connect. And certainly, um, me personally. Uh, found, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm a senior person in PwC. I, you know, I'm generally, I have a very balanced home life with my husband, but even me, when I um, transitioned into the home and working from home, more of the household duties fell on me. So we had to have some adjustment conversations around some of those things, uh, you know, even, even with someone with full support. So it was, it was an interesting challenge. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, again, it continues to change and evolve as, as we, as the adrenaline starts to wear off and yeah. we are, uh, you know, in a new challenge of sustainability and this being our new normal. And I saw some of the com conversations about, um, you know, some of the, some of the podcasts that are available and, uh, you know, at the Adam Grant literature. And so there's option B, which is Cheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant is a great, um, way to talk about how you adjust to your new normal. So I that, I appreciate those comments on the side. Absolutely. I like the point about the adrenaline wearing off. It's like for the Vancouverites, the gross grind and you get to that first placard that says you're a quarter of the way up and you go, oh my God, I still have three quarters of the way. I thought I was almost done. Um, Anoush, uh, tell us about your experience and the experience of your team. Yeah, I was, uh, ours was a bit different. You know, we're we're not a technology company and we've been pretty backward, I guess, over the past few years to the whole work from home model. So we literally had 3000 employees and 3000 desks for each one of those employees globally. So wow. for us, it actually took a bit of foresight on our part to say, well, this looks like it's coming. And we actually worked with some partners across the place to, to allow from that remote working. And we started, addressing this within certain groups and certain business lines to start yeah. testing this out. You know, I think the writing was on the wall when I look back at it um, end of Feb, early March. Um, and we saw this starting to happen in Australia where our head office is. And that's where the funny accent comes from, if anyone's thinking. But, um, you know, so we started looking at the signs and uh, getting the people who had never done this before to start testing it out. And similar to Gene, you know, I think one of the things that we're really, really cognizant of is that people in urban environments might not have that space or, you know, that infrastructure really to work from home. So we started making allowances for people to come in, pick up monitors on, you know, whether it was leading up to it, pick up their um, keyboards and whatever else they needed to and like log that information before we actually started becoming a bit stricter around the whole process or have a process in place. And, uh, you know, we did this overnight globally, you know, whether it was South America, which is still in lockdown, which is, which is sad, but, um, you know, in Chile and Peru with some of our larger offices in Australia, with some of the small offices, which has gone back to work a couple of months ago and pretty much up to 60 to 70% of the workforce is back at work or in North America, you know, where I'm in the office today and there's literally, we're allowed for about 50% of the workforce to come in and there's never more than 15 or 17%, I think, was the most that I've seen it. Um, and again, you know, it's that really slow transition into getting to that comfort level that people are comfortable with. From a team perspective, you know, running IT globally, our team is quite remote at the best of times and everyone's quite technology um, yeah. forward, you know, so for the team on its own, everyone was able to connect and start that remote working. It was up to the leadership, myself and my leadership team to really ensure I guess that mental aspect was dealt with because everyone was working from home. We were supporting 3000 people working from home. Um, you know, we were mailing out people's laptops. We were trying to get people devices to connect. Um, so that pressure was, was really, really strong early on. 
um, never waste a good pandemic. We did come out shining, you know, we did, uh, we did well. And, you know, I think that insight and that's, what's really transformed for me within that business, you know, the, the IT hero, I call it. And unfortunately that bandwidth wears thin pretty quickly. So we're trying to ride on those coattails as long as we can. Yeah. I think the, the IT leaders are effectively unfireable for many years to come. <laughs> I don't know about that, mate, but yeah, we'll, we'll go with that one, Matt. Yeah. Um, I mean, thank you for that. And so, I mean, what I've heard from a lot of people and yourselves just now is we've had to make various accommodations for various team members. And in some cases, you know, special accommodations for young people that are living with six others in their home, um, working parents, especially mm -hmm. um, working mothers, you know, lots of articles about women being disproportionately affected. You know, what, what I'd like to know is, you know, as you're managing this and as we're making accommodations, how can we be equitable? So how can you, you know, Salesforce as, as an example, just offered six weeks of vacation for parents. And I'm sure all the non-parents are thinking, you know, what's going on here. So as you're providing unique accommodations for those that need it, how can you ensure the rest of your team feels that you're there be, being treated as fairly as the others? Maybe we'll start with you, Jean. Yeah, so I think there's so there's a there's a lot in there, and it's very nuanced. And and quite frankly, as we're working with organizations, they're coming up with different different approaches. But there's a common process, right? So it's really so you know equal isn't fair, much like when you're raising yeah. children, right? Uh, and so we have to acknowledge that some of our workforce may need help versus others. The other piece is that we have to acknowledge that there is a preference and quite frankly, right now a need to think about yeah. remote and hybrid working. And so while employers and leaders, what we've seen from our data have a real strong predisposition to get back to normal. Uh, and that means 100% in the office. Um, employees don't want that. And we're in a situation where many of them can't handle that right now um, for whatever the reasons are. And so hybrid working models are here to stay and they need to be working on those, those elements. So really about understanding the population, those populations, understanding what the, the needs are of each of those populations and really trying to design something, not for individuals, but for segments that works, that works overall. That's what we're really, where we're really seeing. Thank you. Mikhail, Anuj, who would like to, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so I think it's, it's you know, it's, it, I would like to say it's, you know, it's a delicate subject. And if you think about that, what's happened during, you know, this, after the start of the crisis, another crisis just happened in the States, right? If you recall. And, um, and, 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 um, and that kind of, I like kind of this kind of conscience is that, that's open to consciences about like, yeah, so all we do with maybe not just um, like Afro-American, Afro uh, Hispanic people, every kind of diversity and group like that we need to make sure from a, a company, we make sure that we include everybody. And at the same time, if we think in this way, if we always work remote, there is a chance that people that are really conservative, that doesn't are open to to kind of diversity. That, that the, the this wall breaking this wall of like becoming open to diversity might not be breakable as it was maybe easy or not easy, but it's like workable when it was like in face to face. So, yeah. uh, company, if it's like you know, I have two toddlers. Just my boys just got two one years old at kind of two weekends and. And you know, uh, it's bring a reality, but at the end, there is so many people, so many different reality there, that uh, diversity and inclusion. So I, I, I said that there is someone who did a speech about diversity and inclusion. It's interesting because it's really something that companies really want to understand more toward their toward their data, making sure that they understand the reality. Are they offering flexibility to their workforce? Um, for example, uh, giving like the, the end of the day on Friday, you know, to make sure that people feeling comfortable that they can maybe rush from Monday to to Thursday or maybe the four four day week, like you were as referencing too, right? So, but at the end, to come to the, this kind of reality, it's it's 
uh, I will say this way, it's a hell of a challenge, man. I yeah. think that, you know, like diversity, it's super important. And I think now we have the opportunity with this way of reshaping the workplace to really make it the way our, the, the, the people who work in this generation, like the multiple generation that are working to make it our own way, to move like from the Model T car to maybe the Tesla car, you know, and, and make sure that the workplace adding toward a new reality, right? That's, that will Absolutely. include diversity and inclusion. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. How about you, Anuj? How do we how do we ensure that you know accommodations for employees are you know treated equitably and viewed equitably by employees? Yeah. Look, Matt, I, and you know, really appreciate what the other panelists, Gene and Mikhail, said. It, it's it's a hard one to really come up with some sort of mandate or procedure on. Um, you know, one thing that we've done, and I think we've done quite effectively, not just within my team, but within the organization is, is really work on things. You know, we had, instead of just having, are you okay day, we literally had, are you okay week? And, you know, every meeting that we started was around that, you know, every meeting, the first few minutes, you know, we do a values moment or a safety share at the start of every meeting was around asking your team and talking to your team, um, you know, about are you okay? And if you're not, if that's not the forum, make sure that your leadership team, whether it's top down, you know, whether it's myself or my leadership team are available to have that conversation. Um, and are you okay is just an example. You know, we had about in seven months, we've had about five different iterations of a similar sort of concept, you know, with mental health awareness. And, um, you know, similar to Mikhail, I've got two toddlers and, you know, being aware of, the nuances that come with it, you know, I'm inherently aware of it because of that situation, you know, I understand and I've made it a point to tell my EA and the team that, you know, between nine and 10 AM, I don't want to be disturbed. You know, that's time that I'm going to spend with the older one, whether it's a bike ride, whether it's doing a puzzle or whatever it is, yeah. that's the time I don't want to be disturbed or whether it's the bedtime, bath time routine, you know, cause like I said, you know, I had offices in Australia and I have a lot of meetings in the evenings and at night. So you know, but then there's a slot in the evening where I'm not going to be available for people. And I do that for the rest of the team as well, that I not only just have families, it could be any sort of inherent factor that's in there or affecting their working life, um, being aware of it and making sure that you understand it for all your teams. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to ask about future employees, and then maybe we'll just move to talk about cities and the physical workplace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for current employees that are asking for unique accommodations, you know, how are we treating them equitably, but for new employees, you know, they need to be treated as equitably as, as existing employees. And, you know, is it, is it possible to effectively onboard and train new employees in a work setting? Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to go first, I know it's an yeah. easy question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. So the, yes. you know, at the end of the day, the, from a, a fully remote perspective. Yep. Um, again, one of the things that we, we have been onboarding training on all the tools that that we have for it's it's six months now, right, that we have done yep. that fully virtually. Um, and our employee experience survey data tells us that that we're doing pretty good at it, that it's actually a really great Thanks. experience for people, we surround that with touch points. Um, yep. You know, model modeling behaviors like videos on having having check ins and things like that. So it can be done. Um, I don't think over the long term it does take the place of human contact, right? So you know, those hybrid models are something that we really need to think about. And because what over the long term we have to think about is is the networking pieces. So how are it, at some particular point those onboarding experiences um, will become old hat, they'll become indoctrinated into an individual's um, habits. But what is an unwritten thing that often happens in office space is the networking pieces. So we have to be much yeah. more strategic about that and much more conscious about the things that would just happen organically. Now, the good news is on that side is that we can actually be more strategic about some of those things so that your networking isn't just the person that's down the down the road. It's yep. actually thoughtful around the, the yep. networks that you need to build to do your work and to create a better career for you. Um, you know, so there's, it's a, it's really a, a double-edged sword in that respect. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Just being more strategic about placing people together and 
forcing them to work together where they might not have otherwise just being on different floors in the same building as an example. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, gentlemen? Yeah. Yes, uh, go ahead. Oh, sure, Michael. Um, I think it's a really hard one. You know, the, the onboarding process without having a physical interaction or buddy that we usually have, you know, someone starts mm -hmm. a buddy system going, you know, how do you do a timesheet? Uh, how do you access certain files from a certain folder, you know, in SharePoint? You know, I think that physical aspect is really difficult to, to manage right now, but, you know, we've, we've been doing all right. I feel like it's a gap for us, you know, even though we've got the remote onboarding down to a procedure, I, I definitely feel it's not working the same way. And, you know, Gene, you're right. You know, it needs to be strategic. And, you know, at some point of time, we're hoping to have, um, a fair chunk of those users in the office or some sort of networking event when that is possible. For sure. Um, yes, talking no, about, no. oh, no, go ahead, Mikhail. Yeah, no, I was going to add a, a dimension related to maybe uh, the changes that kind of uh, we see, we observe through our clients, right? So we see that COVID just accelerated, accelerated a lot of the digital transformation, right? To, uh, mm -hmm. to most of, the, of, of our organization. And of course, if you have any kind of HR system, onboarding process is kind of one of the key elements that will need to be redesigned from a system perspective, right? Um, I tie to that, you know, uh, one really good thing that, you know, you can think about um, is really try to really couple people like with mentor, right? Make sure that from the start, you have a proper mentor taking care of this person, making sure that it's a, it's, it's really something that, you know, uh, you, you, you attach a mentor to a new hire. So this way, from the first week, you have real human contact, you know, mm -hmm. and you can make it like, of course, we say like, it's a safe zone. You, it's not mandatory to go on video, video conference, but at the end, asking to be in video conference, try to kind of. I, um, come with really a human touch will be uh, crucial, right? Because at the end, digital transformation might also drive like more effectiveness of the onboarding process to make sure everybody, uh, but at yeah. the end, we need to keep the human touch and mentor can be a really good key here. Are more, I'm curious if you have the data, are more or less people filling out their onboarding checklist? Because I know, you know, we get it, we get checklists like that when you, you know, fill out this survey. Are more people filling those out today, being at home and maybe having more time on their hands? So this is the thing. So it, it's tied up to all the old process. So if you think about, I will talk a bit about my experience, but I know that on Workday, you know, you can easily kind of create those kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, automated steps. So this is the thing. So where you, of course, it will bring a lot of challenge for for companies who have a lot of stuff that are still on paper, all you do yeah. that, oh, you need to send a scan and you need all that. Uh, so this is where HR, you, we see that 59% of company will, will need to accelerate. So this mm. is the, their digital at the transformation, especially on HR. So so this is kind of those things that are gonna be like those gap, those or those um, pain point that will, will help also to improve onboarding, uh, yeah. So yeah, does it answer your question? Sorry, uh, yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, okay. Um, so Michaela is telling us we have about 10 to 15 minutes left. Thank you. Um, so a couple of questions. I do wanna talk about cities um, and I wanna talk about physical locations of employees because we are working remotely. Um, generally speaking, you know, 80% of people are not going to their office building. Some have taken dramatic steps and actually relocated their residences. You know, we have friends personally that They've moved to Kelowna, they've moved to the Sunshine Coast. Um, you know, do you have team members who have, you know, essentially made a long-term decision to move their family based on reasonably short-term information? And, you know, what do you think the impact of people making these shifts will be for your organization? Not to pick on Gene, but maybe we'll just, we have a nice sequence where you start and... <laughs> sure. Yeah, so we're we are definitely seeing that all over the place. Um, so we're so uh, there's a couple of trends from you know from a from a city's perspective. We are seeing um, a shift in thought process. We we are already saw this right. We know our urban centers are overpopulated. That mm -hmm. housing is becoming unreasonably priced. 
Um, the commutes are getting ridiculously long so that yeah. people are starting to have sacrifices in their quality of life. And, you know, we're probably, it's us or our children who will be that generation that is worse off than, than we are. And yeah. so that has really, even before COVID, created a discussion and a dialogue that was happening around work based in communities and neighborhoods versus in very concentrated urban centers. Um, COVID now I think has given us the platform to talk about that in a much more serious way rather than people dabbling. But we did see it, you know, we see it in the GTA um, and we're seeing it in Vancouver, people moving out of downtown cores yeah. uh, to, to different places, you know, so, so that shift is, is happening. Uh, in remote work, we are seeing that dramatic side of the house where people are moving, uh, they're canceling traveling plans and relocation plans, um, and it is creating the need for businesses to review their HR policies about relocation, right? And yeah. so, uh, and how they're doing that, what they will pay for from a travel perspective, and again, really, really important for organizations to go back to first principles are on, you know, what is what is fair, what is what is needed, um, because there will be a lot of nuanced conversations. And so design principles are really important about that can yeah. guide yeah. some of those decisions. Um, more so a more tactical and immediate uh, consequences. So you talked about friends moving, you know, maybe from a downtown core to the Sunshine Coast or, or Kelowna. What we're seeing is people moving to their home in Florida or their place in Hawaii, um, or they're yeah they're moving from Toronto to Vancouver because they like the weather, um, yeah. and that yeah. creates a whole host of tax consequences. Um, for both the employer and the employee. And so, uh, as well as immigration and visa issues. So even if you're working with the same employer because you are physically located, much of the tax legislation and immigration policy is related to where you are physically located. So it can get people into a whole host of problems. Um, so I would, you know, if there's a cautionary tale, I would say, you know, make yeah. sure that we are, you're understanding that landscape before you're approving anything. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Um, I mean, we've also heard notable examples, you know, Facebook being one of the biggest to say that they will adjust employees pay downwards uh, mm -hmm. if they choose to move farther from HQ. Um, you know, another set of issues with that, but, you know, does the group have any thoughts on you know, I guess, essentially location-based pay. Look, I'd be lying if uh, I said in an executive perspective, we've not had those conversations. We have yeah, for had sure. people um, within, the, within my team, as well as uh, some of the other teams that have made that move. Um, and we haven't addressed anything related to their pay. The only thing that we said was, you know, just need to make sure that when we do need to have a physical meeting or group get together, whenever that time is, um, you're happy to fly down, you know, whether it's Kelowna or Calgary are the two that we had, well, I had in my team, um, that they're making the trek over, you know, at whatever point of time. So, you know, as long as that agreement is there, we're not being super prescriptive about it or getting things in writing, you know, as long as that agreement is there is, you know, when, when your leadership team requires you at a certain point, you're at that point. But you know, I think, and, and this is a personal opinion, uh, hopefully it's not too, um, too, not too much argument over it is, you know, I do see that the argument of adjusting pay based on location, you know, because you are paid on where you're located and, you know, the market at those particular positions. So, um, yeah, th that's what we're looking at right now. Yeah. And for, for either you or News or, or Mikhail, you know, do you think there's a trend long term that if people move away from urban centers, they're then paid less and they begin to miss out either from a compensation perspective or potentially a, you know, career advancement perspective. Will that be the trigger to force people to come back to cities? So I, I think not from a career perspective, but, mm. you know, definitely from the pay perspective, perspective, I do see that being an issue, Matt. Mm. Interesting. Mikhail, you had a thought? Yeah. So I, you know, we were, starting couple like some couple of years uh we are in this like uh, we switched to human capital management right to human experience management right and this thing of going back to home and 
and are we gonna address the compensation of worker can have a, a, a major impact about all the experience within the company will be yeah. advertised on the on the mar, on the uh, on the job market, right? So, to kind of link to your question, you know, think of this way: if I'm working for a given kind of company for the same work, I, I'm I'm being paid like fifty thousand dollars, and while working for home and for the same company, I I can be paid seventy thousand dollars. Kind of, we we can and 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 my experience with the virtual experience will be better, you know, and all that. So I think it's really a, a challenge to take in consideration that we should not lose and focus the experience of the employee, right? Know, know about what we really want to offer to him, right? Of course, there yeah. will actually, what we're living, all the company living, severe, severe uh, financial impact, right? Um, doesn't mean that it needs to be permanent as well, right? The decision that they take actually, actually. But they need yeah. to think about this long, long-term approach of, uh, of uh, people experience, right, within their company. For sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have about five minutes left before we're taking a few questions from the audience. Um, maybe I'll try to end with something that's uh, mildly controversial. Um, you know, everyone talks about, we've talked about employees returning, you know, t- thinking about employers requesting that we, that we return or maybe strongly encouraging that employees return. The convenient answer today seems to be when there's a vaccine. Um, Netflix's CEO said they'll be back 12 hours after there's a vaccine, which seems a little extreme. Um, But I guess, can you foresee a world where we come back to the office before there's a broad-based vaccine available? Let me all start with you, Anoush. Yeah, look, mate, um, I'm going to say not till that point of time. We actually went through that process of strongly yep. encouraging people in Vancouver yeah um, and you can see it you know just as a like for like comparison when we did a similar sort of thing in Brisbane in Australia um, where there was hardly any cases everyone decided to go back to work you know and we're literally mm. having to turn people away from the door with the booking mm. system you know if you can't book in you know your 60% capacity sorry you can't come in today um, whereas in Vancouver we did a similar sort of thing a couple of months ago and it hasn't bought any traction at all. And mm. you know, I feel like it is related to the amount of cases, you know, and that comfort level um, yep. is a big one. So, you know, the answer is yes, yeah, still there's a vaccine. I don't think we'll we'll see that regular foot traffic into the office. Interesting. How about you, Mikhail? Is there a world where we come back before there's a vaccine or could we ever be mandated by our employers to come back before there's a, a vaccine available? So, so it's really a kind of a, a picky question, right? Because at the end, one thing about that, all the company policy, like all, all you're gonna, this, they're gonna need to be rewritten, right? Uh, yeah. All the collective bargain uh, agreement, right? Uh, yeah. You know, and it's not kind of, you know, you can force someone and it in the human right, you know, to decide, yeah, this is a thing you need to do, right? Because it, we talk about human health. I think that related to the vaccine use case, we need to think about, okay, so whatever is gonna happen, right? Maybe like the federal government will say, yeah, we need a vaccine for all the country, you know? Uh, but the first thing is like, company need to start thinking about how they're gonna manage a return to work, you know? How are we gonna manage? Do we go with wave? Are we end up maybe going from wave one or two and go back to wave zero because we need to mm. shut down because of a of a, dis- a government like decision or something like that? Like actually what we're living, is it mm-hmm. the last, you know, wave? Like in terms of we are all in wave two across the country, right? Are we going to hit a wave three in terms of COVID-19? Um, how the company will plan their workforce to, do, to manage this kind of back and forth, allowing yeah. cert- a certain amount, not full capacity, but you know. And I think this is like the next big thing about whatever is the rule behind the vaccine. There are so many legal agreement behind that, that mm-hmm. the first thing a company needs to think about is like, okay, from a, just a normal operational standpoint, how I can handle like managing my the flow of my worker in my my workspace. Yeah, no, it's interesting, and I've heard that in the U.S. it's even more complicated given the, oh, the yeah. insurance and the liability uh, potential for bringing people back and somebody's somebody's affected. Um, curious for your thoughts, Jean, before we move to uh, questions from the audience. Yeah, so employers have a duty to create a safe workplace. So there's plenty of ways to do that even right now if, if employers really want to mandate. And you can think about all of 
all of the precautions that happen for field workers who have never right. left the workforce. Um, but I would say that's probably the wrong question because I think an employer who's wanting to mandate people back to work is missing the strategic opportunity of a flexible workforce. Hmm. And the potential cost savings that that could yeah. entail, yeah. the potential, potential to expand the talent market that they're able to access, the impact on diversity and inclusion, you know, you can, you can access people with mobility issues or whatever it is. And so yeah. this is not a negative. This is a different situation that employers need to be looking at the positives and thinking strategically about yeah. how they yeah. want to structure this. So, you know, my, the work that we're doing with employees and employers, it really is a win-win situation. Yeah. And, you know, I, again, I've, I've, been consulting for quite a long time and those are my favorite situations you don't always get that um, but this doesn't have to be an adversarial conversation yeah that's a fantastic answer and a great point to close on is that it can be strategic it is a positive it's an opportunity for employers to engage with their teams in a way that they couldn't before and to you know as you said make accommodations for people that maybe would never have entered that particular workplace in the first place um, so thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Um, moving to some questions. I see Tim out in the backyard there. Hey, Tim, board member, Tim, how's it going? It's going well. And, uh, thanks for this perfect opportunity to get on the rowing machine and do four kilometers, uh, in the middle of a work day. So that was kind of fun. Awesome. A quick question. Uh, so, uh, actually one comment, then a quick question. So first of all, Facebook uh, is saying that they're going to uh, adjust salaries compared to where you live. Uh, that's great if you're Facebook, but uh, you know, natural selection and the world of uh, economic markets are gonna dictate whether those people are employed by Facebook next year or somebody else, preferably a startup from Vancouver in about a year's time. <laughs> so uh, this is now uh, a global eBay or a global Amazon market for talent. Uh, so, yep. you know, adjust the compensation at your peril. Uh, the other question is, um, this is actually more of a ask to the whole audience and then sort of a bit of a suggestion and perhaps directly to IBM. Uh, so I went to have a look at as uh, uh, what's my bubble size app? And what that means is how can I prove to my customers that my bubble is small enough that I can be invited on premise to have a face-to-face -face meeting because at the end of the day, no matter how virtual we are, we still need to get face-to-face -face with our customers to close anything more than a monthly subscription rate. So uh, the other extension to that is how big is my bubble is uh, we, everybody has a phone. Uh, it's uh, constantly looking for different uh, Wi-Fi connections, different Bluetooth connections. We can pretty rapidly find out how many people we've been in contact with. And then when it comes to how's my workforce doing, uh, yeah. it's a possibility that you can look at your employee and see how many, how big is your bubble, how many people you've been in contact with, and maybe this person is at risk of some mental health issues. So any ideas uh, you know, for the panel? Does uh, any thoughts on that? And I'll put myself on mute and listen. Thanks very much for, for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. Who wants yeah, to take so, that one? So. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity, like in terms of development of innovation, right? Then uh, here I, I can share one thing we do for workplace, real workplace, like because of course there will be office that will really be reopened uh, based on their way of doing things, right? They need people. Uh, we are not yet close to the robot, yet, right? <laughs> things like that. So we we have kind of one way we do this is like by using Wi-Fi signal to try to kind of get track, leveraging the phone. So this way, you know, it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's been out there since a couple of years, but I think it's not the technology related to Wi-Fi signal with the Bluetooth related to the phone. Uh, I know there is a startup as well in, in Montreal, Real Active, that, that's leveraging this technology. And, and, you know, I think it's a, to measure the bubble size or not, or like how close people can get, I think it can be a good way to leverage uh, technology, the, 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 the internal technology of like infra infrastructural Infrastructure technology, sorry, uh, you know. So it's a it's a way. I don't know if it's answering your question, Tim, but I think it might be a a possibility to uh, to 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 leverage Wi-Fi for kind of geolocation within the office to measure the bubble size and 
And after that, decide rules like, uh, and with the half say, yo, you work too close. Don't go there anymore. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I can add on to that, Tim. You know, we've seen uh, some governments across the place mandate the use of an, an app um, to track it. So use the technology that you just sort of mentioned, Mikhail, with uh, um, Bluetooth as well as Wi-Fi. And, um, you know, sorry, they stopped short of mandating and they strongly encouraged it to use to use the previous uh, terminology that we had in the last question. And, you know, you had to have a good data set of those users actually accepting and downloading the app and using the app to make it worthwhile. And um, the government that I'm talking about in particular is in, in Australia where, where they did, but they didn't have enough of a market set to really push that bubble approach um, to get the right feedback of the numbers. So they did get some initial data from it, but they weren't able to use it successfully. So it's really about the right or, or getting everyone to actually use it. Yeah. The cap is. Hey Matt, I'm just monitoring the chat here. There's another question, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I can just read it out if you want. Uh, from Bev Atfield, a question for the panel. With such poor engagement levels previously, surely we don't want to go back. What are your thoughts on what we can, sorry, and how we can embrace going forward regarding employee engagement? So I guess, how do we use this period to increase, increase employee engagement. engagement that was previously low? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a, you know, a number of different things. So I always talk about, so when we work with clients, what we're really trying to do is establish where are, you see, cause you can't, make a perfect day for anyone, that's not realistic. So we try to work on moments that matter. Uh, and so moments that matter for an employee either happen within their day. So, you know, when they first get up for work, uh, when they first arrive at the office, when they go home, when they, you know, when they, they are in a meeting or they happen over their career. So uh, when they're first recruited, when their first day of onboarding. So I bet you in your current, your current work, you can remember your first day, like how that, you know, even as an entrepreneur, how, how you started that process, you usually remember that day, right? That's a moment that matters. So those are the, those are the pieces where you're trying to pick out the ones, those moments that matter. And then you create an environment for that set of employees that really stands out from your competitors, right? Cause you are in a war for talent and that's generally how we look at it. Um, you know, that's generally how we look at it. And it, again, this is where creativity and that entrepreneurial spirit can really come into effect, right? About how you make those those days really fantastic. And that's why you see some of those, you know, the startup tech com uh, companies really change the face and the, the, the way people are engaged. Um, you know, yeah. so I just, I think it's a perfect way for entrepreneurs to change the game and to make something different, right? To get to access talent that potentially larger organizations don't do. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, there's another question in there. <clears throat> it's, I'll read the, the exact question and then I guess my interpretation. Would the global workforce competition favor developing places like India or Vietnam, even though they have their own struggles with COVID and natural disasters? Uh, you know, my take on this is, you know, probably not for existing employees where we talk about Facebook moving people. Maybe they, you know, they moved from California to Idaho and they may or may not have their pay adjusted. But for a new employee that says, I'm working remotely somewhere else in the world, and I want to come in as an engineer and make $150,000 a year, is that engineer now competing against places globally where there's maybe cheaper engineering talent in India, Vietnam, or elsewhere globally if you don't know this person and haven't met them and they haven't visited your, your workplace? Uh, at least that's my interpretation of the question from Stanley Lee. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, for us, we've actually done this now. And, um, you know, again, using this as an opportunity, we have actually um, looked at roles in certain positions that have been difficult to get um, in markets in Canada, South America, and Australia. We've actually expanded that because everyone's working remotely in any, in any case. Um, mm. That's really looking at that task-based economy. Um, you know, there's apps around it. There's, I think, Fiverr over here or Airtasker. Yeah. 
et cetera. You know, so using that sort of a model and there's companies that specialize in this um, to look at those tasks or projects that you have and leverage a workforce um, anywhere overseas. You know, I think the examples are India, India and Vietnam, but you know, anywhere across the globe. So, so far it's working all right for us, you know, and you know, we're looking to, to expand on it where those tasks dictate that that, they, that is possible. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, so, uh, no other comments. Oh, um, there's one. There's there one more on. there. Go ahead, Scott. I'm gonna say for Anuj, uh, I really like the concept that you ask your employees how they are doing and not just uh, right away jump into daily tasks during a meeting. How do you provide a psychological safety to employees so that they really feel comfortable voicing that? Great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Look, um, we do you know, for, for, from a personal perspective, like, you know, I've had people reach out to me personally and given that comfort level that they have to be able to do that is really important. Um, you know, and I think if I understand your question cor correctly, you know, that sanctity or that confidentiality that comes with that or the power that comes with that, that's really important to us. You know, we do have programs within the business that we could point them to towards, you know, whether it's Free psychiatric help, psych, psychologist, psychologist help, or um, those kinds of programs, but we try to address it. You know, most of the ones that I've had people reach out, I've addressed it one on one. Um, you know, I think a lot of the ones have just been a simple. Let's go out for lunch and have a conversation. You know, what's going on? How can we help? Um, do you need to take some time? We're more than happy to look at that and alternatives around it. You know, it's it's really what I've found is people just having that space to reach out. And I, I think one of the things that we see really works is when you show that you're not perfect. Yeah. Um, it, it just creates the openness that you are a real person, that you have challenges. So, you know, the, just the tenant of you go first. Um, it's something that I try and kind of keep in my life because, and, you know, we all have chaotic lives. We all have things we're struggling with. So when you let a little bit of that into your conversation, it opens the door for someone else to talk about it from, from their perspective. Absolutely. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, is Michaela on? I was just, I wasn't sure yes. about the protocol for switching things. Um, I, I mean, I wanted to thank the thank the panelists. Thank you for letting me, you know, hopefully politely interrogate you today. Um, it was fantastic information. I know I learned a lot, um, and hopefully the audience did as well. So thank you very much for participating and and for all your prep work in advance. Um, maybe I'll hand it over to Michaela to talk about virtual networking. Sure. Just. Um... Just quick, yeah, thanks again, Matt, for, for moderating, and thanks again for the panelists for donating your time to, to come talk to us today. Uh, we would appreciate it if everyone could complete an event survey that you would have been emailed. Um, you know, we're always looking for better ways to, to, I guess, provide a better experience during these events, so your feedback is definitely important to us. Um, quick plug for our next forum that's happening in November. The topic's going to be AI in 2020. Um, you would also receive a registration link in the in, your, in an email for that next event. So hopefully we can see you again at the next event in November. Um, so yeah, with that, we'll move on to breakout rooms for the next 15 minutes, uh, just additional opportunities to network with uh, your peers that are on the call. Um, we'll have the chat open and monitored still. So please feel free to, to message us if you have any other questions there. Um, and yeah, board, board members, panelists will also feel free to jump into chats too. And so we'll, we'll move there to continue the discussion. So thanks again, everyone for joining. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Matt and uh, the team for having us. Jeez. Thanks yes, very much, thanks guys. Thanks very much, everyone. All right. Take care. Yes, thank you.